Hello, welcome to the Friday, May 29th, 2020 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Back when we were still meeting at conferences and handing each other USB drives, for example, with virtual machines for the class, there was always that little bit uneasy feeling, that little bit snickering about, well, I have to plug this USB drive that you just gave me into my computer. Can I trust it? And of course you can trust USB drives that I give you, but uh, what could possibly happen? Now, back in the old days, of course, there were a lot of these sort of auto run style exploits where software would run as soon as you plug in a USB drive, but that has been less of a problem on a well configured system. Another issue, however, are various USB drivers that have to interact with the USB drive and a new tool USB fuzz has looked at vulnerabilities in USB drivers that are included in operating systems. And of course, uh, they found quite a few of them. They discovered a total of 26 new vulnerabilities across various operating systems, including Linux, which got 16 out of those 26, one bug in FreeBSD, three in Mac OS, and then the remainder is sort of distributed between Windows 8 and Windows 10. Now, I didn't see when reading this any sort of direct uh, remote code execution vulnerabilities, but uh, there are some blue screen of deaths, there are some system freezes and such, and whenever you have a denial of service like this created by a fussing tool, could be a potential for code execution, but of course these fussing tools uh, often don't trigger the code execution, but instead just a system crash. Now, good news here, the bugs were reported to the respective operating system. Many of them have been patched. The USB fuzz tool that was used uh, to find these vulnerabilities will soon be open sourced, has not been open sourced yet, but the, the name of the GitHub repository has already been announced. And of course, I'll add a link to the complete paper uh, to the show notes. And Cisco is joining the party, maybe a little bit late, advising its customers of vulnerabilities related to salt stack that are part of Cisco's products. Now, the reason Cisco wasn't very quick about this is the only products affected here are the Cisco Modeling Labs Corporate Edition, as well as the Cisco Virtual Internet Routing Lab Personal Edition, and the Salt Stack servers for this are actually maintained by Cisco Infrastructure. However, they state while the servers were upgraded on May 7th, well, they already had been compromised, at least some of uh, these Cisco World PE release servers 1.2 and 1.3 were compromised uh, before the patch was installed and the compromise was remediated on May 7th as well. The problem here is if you're running one of the affected uh, Cisco virtual labs, uh, well, they did connect back uh, to these compromised uh, salt stack servers that were maintained uh, by uh, Cisco. So definitely read all the details in Cisco's advisories if you are running one of these products. And we got another nail in the coffin of SHA-1 now. Earlier this week, of course, we talked about SHA-3 and how it fails to pick up a little bit. Well, uh, SHA-1, according to the latest research by researchers in France and Singapore, can now be cracked with as little as $45,000 in compute time. Affected are, for example, PGP, but also TLS and SSH, of course, is affected by this and they used 900 NVIDIA GTX 1060 GPUs to demonstrate their feat. Now, uh, there are different sort of prices quoted here, but it's certainly within the range of uh, organized crime to deploy uh, these kind of uh, techniques. 
And well, it should be noted that uh, most cryptographic systems are phasing out SHA-1, like for example, SSH. Where this may be a little bit a problem is in some legacy equipment that only supports SHA-1, you may now be forced to use clear text protocols like HTTP and Telnet instead of HTTPS and SSH, which uh, may actually be sort of counterproductive. Uh, SHA-1, well, it's still uh, tens of thousands of dollars uh, to break SHA-1, while last time I checked, well, Telnet and HTTP HTTP doesn't cost anything. So I hope they leave an option to still have the client connect to these servers using SSH and HTTPS, using some of these weak protocols, since in my opinion, they're still better than nothing and not everybody can afford to upgrade their entire infrastructure. Okay, with me today is uh, Andy Piazza, and as we have done in the past on Fridays, uh, he's an SDI student that just wrote a real interesting research paper. Andy, uh, could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, my name is Andy Piazza. I'm the chief evangelist for a company called FIA LLC here in Northern Virginia area. I'm also a cyber threat analyst for a client during the day. Once a year, I get to have the pleasure of being the director of operations for B-Sides Nova. And I'm currently working my way through the SANS Masters in Information Security Engineering. So I like to keep myself a little busy, touching a little bit of everything in InfoSec. But that's a, that's me in a nutshell so far. Yeah, B-Side's always a great program uh, to be sort of part of. I know they have them here in Jacksonville. Hope they'll have it again this year. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Yeah. We were lucky enough to have ours right at the beginning of March, right before the world shut down. So Okay, yeah, so you were lucky there. Yeah. So let's talk a bit about your research paper. Uh, could you just give us a quick intro, what it's all about? Yeah, so the name of the paper, Quantifying Threat Actor Assessments. The whole idea was, you know, there's a lot of great information in, in threat intelligence. I tried to take an approach to bring all that information together and do an assessment of threat actors. One, to just to bring together all that, that body of knowledge over all the different vendors and threat reports, but also as a really as a means to communicate with executives and leadership in everything that we know and kind of ranking them in that traditional like risk assessment model that executives are already used to seeing. That was really the challenge that I was looking at when putting together this model was how do I mirror something that they're already used to seeing, be able to clearly communicate on a one slider, what threat actors do we care about? How do we compare them to each other? Basically what the whole paper is about with a lot of interesting math behind it. That's actually a, a real big and important problem or like, you know, what do you focus on in information security? I think just in a recent podcast I mentioned, it's always sort of the the shiny thing that, you know, us sort of as techies often are after, but that may not necessarily be what what you really worry about or how did you address that? How did you try to get a little bit more quantitative uh, approach here to figuring out what are the threat actors that I actually worry about? So I knew we wanted to focus right on when you're talking about threats, you want to really focus on the intent and capability. I went out and looked at the existing risk models and they, every time they talk about threat, it was that very static threat of earthquake or malware. It wasn't that human threat of there's motivations behind it. So it was, you know, we, it was how do I capture that intent and capability um, on a, you know, just X, Y axis and, and kind of plot that out. Uh, what it really boiled down to was there's a lot of good intelligence that rates capabilities of actors and, you know, how, how complex their malware is or how good they're living off the land. We really want to focus it back on the target, right? The, the most important thing is being selfish is why do I care about these actors or why did my organization care about these actors? So every question we looked at uh, we broke out threat actors into four different categories, um, espionage, cybercrime, destructive and disruptive attacks. And every time we looked at it, it was what is the evidence from intelligence say about the actor, this actor's capability to use or uh, intent to use this capability or to target my sector. It was always driving back to, you know, what does the intelligence say about this, about this? And it was, it's a really good way to scope. Oftentimes in analyst circles, you'll get into the what ifs and the crazy ideas. Um, so we just created a, a simple five uh, score uh, matrix for intent and five score for capability. And really just try to focus on that um, to, to keep from rabbit holing down into to the what ifs. So the intent is, I think, uh, really interesting here because a lot of uh, 
threat actors have very similar capabilities, uh, no matter how sophisticated they are. Uh, whether it's a script kitty trying to get some ransomware in your system, or whether it's a nation state attacker, they're probably both starting with an email with a office attachment with a macro kind of thing. They may both succeed, uh, but the script kitty, I guess, if it doesn't succeed, they move on. You know, they move on to the next target. While that more target attack, uh, they may actually try now a better vert uh, document, or uh, they actually do the extra work to do the reconnaissance to figure out what is sort of the the lure that someone would be clicking on in that organization. Is that sort of what this is going after? Yeah, absolutely. So some of the categories in the in the scale, the five point scale for intent is you know the lowest is target of opportunity. Uh, that's a one. Uh, then there's regional association. Uh, you know, why would this actor target my organization? Um, you know, if it's taking out Dyn DNS and you know messing up a bunch of services, kind of a thing. Or you know, um, moving on like to to sectors. If a bunch of threat intelligence just says you know financial sector, and I'm in the financial sector, I should worry about this actor. Um, but ideology, you know, it goes up to level four. Is ideology right? If we're associated with the U.S. government because we're a government agency or we're associated with some political statement that, that our CEO made, you know, that tends to piss off certain countries if they make certain statements, right? That, that can escalate things. So that would be like level four for ideology and then target specific. Uh, and this is the hard one, this, cause everyone wants to say, I'm, you know, I'm a precious snowflake. So the bad guys want me, but really that's more sector, right? If you're in a banking institution and, um, and they're financially motivated, they're, they're more than likely looking at it from sector organization. The, the level five really is what data specifically is in my enterprise or systems or end goal is in my enterprise that they can only get in my enterprise. And that really makes it hard to put an actor at a level five. Um, and that was kind of the end point was could put all of the big, bad, scary APTs in the upper right corner of the red area of the chart and scare our executives. It was how do we really filter through the noise and say, don't worry about that latest vendor report that someone just emailed you. This is still where it's at on the chart by, by our assessment. And that's really difficult. You know, um, yes, there are these you know, nation state attackers out there that have sort of you know, infinite resources, but they may not necessarily be after your data. Right. Um, on the other hand, sometimes just being in the periphery can matter. You know, I think that was just a couple of months ago where uh, some vendor for SpaceX was compromised. And apparently, that the goal was to get after SpaceX data. If you are a vendor for uh, a big uh, target like this, I guess sometimes it gets a little bit difficult to figure out that you're a target as well, or how would that sort of fit into your model? Uh, that's an interesting use case. Yeah, is if you're the, the hopping point or, or the, um, you know, someone in the supply chain and you're trying to uh, assess it, you know, it makes it a little bit more difficult um, to assess that, but you have to understand what are your, your relationships with your business. So you may be the only um uh, stepping stone or the softest stepping stone to a bigger target and understanding your enterprise is absolutely un critical to having a good threat model um, and having good threat understanding or understanding of the threats facing your enterprise. Uh, interesting in the, so in the paper, I introduced three notional organizations. Um, one of them was a big global IT company that sells IT services and cloud stuff. And one of the things I did in theirs um, that kind of helps with this example, I, under, I broke out that the team understood that they have a difference between their core corporate network and the services they provide, right? Their data and their cloud storage may be a, a bigger target than their actual corporate network where their email is. Um, so a similar kind of model could be done if you're considering yourself as, you know, supply chain to a, a bigger target. Um, I, I, that's definitely something you'd have to consider. Yeah. So um, make it a little bit more specific, um, Amazon, yeah. Uh, sure, they have the e-commerce sites, they have credit card numbers there, but that's probably a much lesser target, even though there's a lot of data there than their cloud operation where um, I could break into a lot of organization if I would be able to breach uh, Amazon's uh, cloud operation center. Right. So if I was if I was on the Amazon threat intelligence team, I would want to do a threat box for the core network and then a threat box for the actual services they provide. Um, obviously, they, they have a lot of great intellectual property in the corporate network as well. But let's be honest, it's more than likely going to be their cloud services that people are targeting. And it's less about their data and more about the, the customer data that could be in their cloud. And like the, the other thing I liked about the paper was not the sort of understanding of threat intelligence going beyond just looking at sort of the techniques and 
IOCs and such, uh, but also trying to figure out uh, why would uh, this particular organization or this particular uh, threat actor uh, target me? Um, where do you get this intelligence from? Kind of, you know, how how do you learn about this? Uh, you know, for for the purposes of the paper, I, I used a couple of open source references. The MITRE ATT&CK framework has a great actors page and has just a whole body of knowledge behind all of the actors there. Uh, the Malpedia actor groups as well. Then there's the open source Google um, link, uh, Google spreadsheet, uh, APT operations uh, and campaigns, I think the name of it is. Um, so I use that as my backstop to pretend that that was my threat intelligence team uh, body of knowledge. But, you know, really, this is about having a team do it. And they've got, you know, 10, 20 years of experience reading through all these reports and, you know, the, the vendor space, the open source space, the close, close reporting, the, you know, the, the threat intelligence feeds. It's really where it's all coming from and understanding, you know, reading through a threat report and saying, you know, China breached OPM for PII and my, my agency is known to store a bunch of PII. Maybe this is, you know, ratchets them up from just being ideology association to target specific. This is something they're interested in. Um, and so as you're briefing this from month to month or quarter to quarter, whenever you're in front of the executives uh, on the threat box, you have a little arrow, you know, red arrow up or down, kind of like the stock market that says that this score went up. And that's a talking point during the briefing, right? You can't brief the, the scores over and over again. So you really, when I, I recommend when individuals brief this, they, they focus on the high scores, of course, anything that's up in that five by five scary um, big red right corner, but also any, any changes and explaining those changes. You know, the threat intelligence team read a new report that, you know, those actors got arrested or um, there's a new report that, uh, that we're getting ready to go to war. Those are the types of things that, that could move a, something up or down. And uh, your experience, it worked well with the executives. They sort of caught on to that idea. And yeah, absolutely. Actually, we were using it for my current client. We designed it for them. Um, the, the original model, I, I built on top of it for this paper and added, um, there's some willingness modifiers and basically some, some down scoring for, you know, we may have the only information or we may be the only organization with information that the UK is interested in, but UK is more than likely going to ask us for it instead of hack this kind of a thing, right? So there's some, hmm. some modifying uh, modifiers there and then also on the capability side. So uh, but my, it was cool on, when I posted out that my article was published this week and was super excited. Uh, the CISO and my client actually commented on there that he he absolutely loves the brief and um, he uses it to brief his executive leadership team regularly. I think it's a, a monthly briefing right now that, that he's providing it. Um, so it was really good, you know, feedback from him. You know, we've, we obviously got it before on the client side, but, you know, to see it publicly and to see that he actually, you know, he caught it and really appreciated it. But yeah, it's um, it's been really really useful. It's been really good actually as a team to, to work through some of our biases and remember some of those reports that we read five years ago about an actor. And, you know, you you think, you know, you can really work through some of the stuff that maybe you forgot that an actor used to do or, um, um, yeah, just kind of bringing all that, that, uh, body of knowledge together kind of forces you to think through some of that stuff. Okay, great. So what's next? Uh, what, um, uh class or so you take next or you're almost done with your program i just started the uh the critical controls course a couple of days ago so I'm, I'm digging through those mp3s and got about a year left in the program it's been absolutely amazing the the advisors have been great on on both the papers i've written actually and just getting enrolled and everything um it's it's been a really cool program uh, of course i'm i got that big scary gse monster in front of me next year but <laughs> uh I, I think sans has prepared me pretty well for it so i'm ready to tackle it Okay, good, good. And I hope uh, you'll get that behind you. So thanks uh, for joining me here. And the uh, link to the paper will just usually be added to the show notes. So uh, just look it up uh, and the piazza here in the SANS reading room. Thanks.